afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, sticking around. <clears throat> Let's switch a little bit gears uh, here. I'm very excited to share uh, the research that we are doing under the umbrella of um, CERC. And uh, the focus of this presentation today is on um, cement and or concrete, and in particular, in, on decarbonizing um, cement, and, uh, and I will focus on the approach that we are uh, taking. Uh, it, it's our view that addressing uh, decarbonation of um, cement requires um, geoscience and engineering approach. Indeed, the making of cement is, uh, and, and uh, the carbon footprint is uh, without doubt an engineering problem. But as I will show today, uh, the, the root cause of uh, the carbon footprint of uh, cement uh, falls right into uh, the geosciences um, dis disciplines. So, but let's start with the, what, um, what's at stake uh, here. Concrete is one of the most used materials uh, at all uh, times. The first concrete um, it, oh, sorry. The first concrete um, uh, buildings or structures um, uh, made uh, of early cementitious uh, materials have a very rich uh, history. Civilization of all times have used cement or whatever uh, precursors, and today, Concrete is the most used material. Uh, it's second only to water, which means it's the most used man-made material in the world. It's used extensively from buildings to well completion. And just to give you some numbers here, 30 billion tons of concrete is used every uh, each year worldwide, which if we look at the problem in terms of uh, um, uh, in, in, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, per capita uh, basis, this number corresponds to three tons per single person, or even three times as much as 40 years ago. In fact, the demand of concrete is growing, and it's growing much faster compared to steel and also uh, wood. Such a demand clearly poses um, a big challenge for sustainability. In fact, the making of cement uh, so the glue that holds concrete together is responsible for 8, 11% of worldwide um, CO2 emissions. And the core of the problem is really in the root, it has its root in the geosciences. In fact, to paraphrase the head of CEMEX, of, uh, the head of R&D, decarbonation, the making of cement and the decarbonation of cement is not rocket science, but actually it's rock science. Why? At least for two reasons. Cement manufacturing really starts with carbonate rocks, with limestones, which are made of carbon, um, calcium carbonate or calcite, um, and uh, the rock is thermally decomposed through a process called calcination to, produ to produce lime. Calcination is a high temperature uh, process that requires the use of energy. Generally, the energy comes from fossil fuels. However, the use of the energy from fossil fuels is responsible only for 25%, 30% of the emissions. Here, I'm not calculating uh, the, uh, the emissions that come from the transport. But then, it's really true calcination that the, 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 the molecule of calcite is broken into calcium oxide, also known as uh, um, uh, quicklime, and then uh, CO2. And it's truly the breaking down of these molecules uh, that contributes to the majority of the CO2. We are talking about 65%, 70% of the emissions. Then calcium oxide, is mixed with uh, um, 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 uh, alumina, aluminosilicates and, uh, um, and uh, um, um, oh my God, and uh, sulfur, 
um, sulfates. Um, and uh, I had to mention that the mining of carbonate uh, rocks from the cement, for the cement industry is estimated about 2 billion tons of rocks per year worldwide. Uh, this translates into 1,300 megatons of CO2 that is emitted into the atmosphere. And just to give you a sense, this figure corresponds roughly to the amount of cars generated, so the emissions from the cars um, circulating in the US, clearly with uh, some assumptions here. As I mentioned, uh, calcium uh, oxide quicklime is then mixed with the aluminosilicates, can be clay, can be uh, ash, fly ash, or volcanic ash, and then gypsum that act as a moderator, um, and then altogether uh, forms uh, Portland cement. So the first lesson that we can draw from this is that even though in the future more efficient um, technologies for energy will provide us or will help reduce the amount of emissions that come from the use of energy, searching for an alternative um, raw material that drastically reduces the emissions from the, the use of limestone rocks remains absolutely uh, the priority. And finding uh, an alternative uh, earth material uh, means finding a new rock, and so that's why is, uh, the problem is within the geoscience uh, disciplines. But this is only one part of the problem. Once the, the lime is produced, is, so the, the cement is created, uh, then the cement is mixed with um, uh, the aggregates, so generally sand size and gravel size uh, materials then mixed with water, and finally with the reinforcement. And the reinforcement really leads to the second uh, issue. Uh, cement and concrete in general uh, is not good in, um, does not exhibit uh, good tensile stress, and so that's why uh, strength, uh, so that's why uh, reinforcement is uh, uh, needed. Stainless steel uh, reinforcement, and uh, not only data indicate that the reinforced concrete um, produces um, about 15% more carbon emissions compared to the voided uh, carbon um, concrete system, but then um, the reinforcement is also one of the reasons why we have corrosion in, um, uh, in modern uh, concrete. And that is a very interesting uh, fact to remember, because if we think of ancient concrete, ancient concrete does not have any reinforcement, and yet has survived the test of time. Today, we know that modern concrete uh, has a relatively, uh, or shows a relatively short uh, lifespan. In general, generally speaking, um, it's uh, around 80 uh, years, which definitely does not bode well uh, for the total carbon footprint of concrete. And today, we have applications that require performance in harsh environment, whether it's at sea or at depth in the subsurface. In fact, durability normally is not factored in uh, in the computation of the CO2 emission. And I have to say that durability has rem uh, ramifications that go beyond the simple replacement. In fact, if we think of uh, methane leaks, um, Naomi this morning uh, showed uh, the number. Uh, so some of the methane uh, leaks re uh, result from the um, wellbore uh, integrity being compromised, and which is due to the degradation of the wellbore um, cement, whether it's a chemical degradation or also mechanical degradation. So, um, the second lesson learned here is that uh, we definitely need to uh, explore different solutions for increasing the durability of cement and concrete, of course, uh, and also the serviceability, especially for those applications that require um, performance in harsh uh, environment. And so we need to understand how to um, um, include a different type of reinforcement that it's not a large scale uh, reinforcement, for, for example, from stainless steel. 
So before focusing on the uh, technology and the research that we are doing, let's also give a look at the current approaches, how people are tackling uh, this problem so far. The first approach is carbon upcycling. Carbon up uh, upcycling clearly uh, uh, uses or captures the CO2 from the making of the lime, then reject the CO2 into uh, the fresh uh, slurry and transforms supercritical CO2 back into solid, uh, solid carbonate minerals. However, what are the limitations or the problems here? Clearly, uh, the entire manufacturing chain needs to be changed. There are also high costs uh, um, to, to change the manufacturing chain. Uh, this approach is limited to precast because if you want to inject CO2, you, uh, supercritical CO2, you need vessels, so it's just the precast. But then, um, and this is something that not many people uh, talk about, and so it's really the perspective from the geoscience. The fact that this um, uh, solution or this approach creates carbonate minerals, uh, we know uh, that carbonate minerals or calcite in general is a brittle mineral and also very prone to dissolution. So this will not really help the durability uh, that the final uh, product. Let's think, for example, we know that shales are more um, uh, prone to be uh, fracked if more carbonate um, minerals or calcite is present. Uh, so frackability of shales goes up if there are more uh, minerals like um, carbonates. The second approach uh, that is being uh, considered is making cement blends. Portland cement is very high in calcium content because it comes from the making of lime. Uh, and, but then if you want to reduce the lime, you have to put in new uh, chemicals uh, that uh, form new cementitious uh, materials. One of these are alkaline solutions, which could be, uh, which are actually um, both uh, calcium hydroxide and sodium uh, hydroxides. And this is, forms really the basis for alkali activated cements or uh, geopolymers, which are called geopolymers in chemistry. But actually, they resemble, and that's why uh, the, the use of this name, they re resemble very closely um, the, the minerals that form in nature. Our technology and our research really sits in the middle between the making of the Portland cement and the making of alkali-activated um, cement. In particular, we are using a geomimetic approach. Um, as with biomimetics, which are as brought as many transformative materials from Velcro to um, adhesives that um, are inspired by uh, the Kegos skin, we are harnessing uh, structures and also processes um, that mimic how rocks, and rock, in particular rock cement, uh, is making. And so this includes a new rock composition that does not, as we will see, does not have um, the carbon ion, and also looking how to reinforce the, the, the binder and also the cementitious, the, cement, uh, the supplementary cementitious materials at the nanoscale. So here's the basic concept. Certain rocks are not that different from um, concrete, uh, and including, uh, Roman concrete. I must say that I'm always struck by the similarity, at least from the, the, by looking at the microstructure of certain rocks and uh, ancient concrete, uh, which indeed can be fortuitous, uh, but my, the question that I always ask myself, how would anyone think of adding lytics or rubbles, or today they're called aggregates, to a fine materials which is ash and a binder? just to make concrete. So rocks, I know that uh, cement, we know they cement uh, naturally, and uh, sometimes they exhibit high strength without any reinforcement. What you are looking here are, it's basically the cementation of a fault. Uh, you can think of earth as a large scale kiln factory. During earthquakes, fault just break uh, rocks and pulverize the rock to the micron 
or our finer scale, and then internally uh, channel heat to prime the material, so reduce the material, the minerals, to the oxides, uh, and, and make it ready for fluid-mediated uh, reaction, which eventually uh, leads to the formation of this concrete-like rock without any apparent reinforcement. But actually, the reinforcement exists. It's just at a scale that uh, is too tiny, uh, and so it's not visible to the naked high. In fact, nano many times uh, does not always equate to manufactured. You can think of Earth as really an excellent nanotechnologist that uses only water for uh, its chemistry. What you are looking at uh, here, it's an SEM image of an aluminum silicate cement of a certain uh, rocks, and cement here appears as a tangle of nanominerals, um, which, um, and other times, uh, these nanominerals uh, can be um, sometimes tangles, sometimes they are very well uh, aligned. And this really represents the nanoscale glue of rocks. Why are fibers important? And this is really knowledge that comes, and old knowledge that comes from the engineering. The addition of fibers to materials we know increases toughness and stiffness. Uh, so you can see here a plot from 1996, just the addition of 3% of carbon fibers from, uh, to this uh, uh, cement paste increase the strength, but also makes the material more uh, ductile. So you have a transition from um, uh, a stress-strain relationship, which goes from brittle um, um, behavior to a more ductile uh, behavior, which means the material resists uh, stress while accommodating uh, more strain. And the reason is simple, because fibers bridge uh, serve the purpose of bridging fractures and also deflect uh, the, the path of, uh, um, of um, uh, the propagation of uh, a crack. So overall, fiber reinforced material can absorb strain energy, uh, preventing what we call it brittle uh, failure. That's great, but what are the limitations? Why, why we cannot easily add, so simply add fibers to a material or any material. The first limitation uh, here is that from a practical standpoint, uh, there is a limit to which you can add fibers and mix the fibers to a paste. You have to consider that the larger the amount of fibers, indeed the larger is the strength, however then the larger then, the greater is uh, the viscosity. And so this uh, is a limit to the workability of uh, the paste. Uh, poor workability of the paste uh, leads to um, an heterogeneous distribution of the fibers within uh, the material. So that's a problem. But then there is also a second problem, which is fiber debonding. Fibers normally are simply added to a paste. They do not grow into the cement or uh, the paste as they grow into uh, rocks. Therefore, there is a poor chemical affinity within, uh, between the matrix and uh, the, fa the fabric. And because of this extraneous uh, nature, shear strength uh, at, the at the matrix fiber interface is low, that uh, leads then to poor uh, bonding, and that uh, then is responsible for the failure or performance uh, failure due to uh, fiber debonding. But what if uh, fibers were allowed to grow into uh, the paste as they grow in um, rocks? And then in, instead of adding fibers are simple uh, inclusions. And then can we control uh, the amount of fibers that we can grow into the paste when the paste looks still a slurry? And then can we control the topological arrangement? Why is the topological arrangement important? I showed uh, in a few, uh, in some uh, previous slides that if we look at the cement of rocks, uh, sometimes 
Uh, the fibers of this cementitious material can be entangled and other times can be, the fibers can be very aligned. From a mechanical point of view, they have a completely different uh, response. You can see here, this is a result of a simulation. When the fibers are well aligned, oh, sorry, when the fibers are uh, very entangled and disordered, uh, you have a stress-strain um, uh, relationship that um, the behavior of the material is more um, uh, resilient and so as a more ductile behavior. As the fibers uh, become more aligned, strength increases, but then the stress-strain uh, behavior becomes um, or favors a brittle uh, failure. So entanglement uh, is a very important uh, parameter here, and this is not very surprising. If we want to make a fast uh, rope, we just need to uh, braid uh, the, um, the strands or create some knots. And in order to increase the strength of a more ductile behavior, we just need to increase the number of fibers per unit uh, volume. The, the picture, the simulation, sorry, the simulation that I mentioned, that I showed uh, here, all the, the, um, uh, the only parameter that is changing is only, is just the entanglement of the fibers and the alignment. But then the number of fibers is kept constant. So if you want to increase the strength, you need to increase the number of fibers. So with all this in mind, we are leveraging knowledge from engineering and the geosciences to formulate a new clinker through a geomimetic approach, just looking at rocks. So here I'm showing, um, we are now focusing on an alternative uh, rock, so it's an alternative um, raw uh, materials. Um, as a binder, we are at the moment also um, blending different type of uh, rocks. And here in this uh, plot, I'm showing the mass loss upon pyroprocessing uh, the, the, um, the rock. You still, you still have a rock, and so you have minerals. You have to reduce the minerals to uh, oxides. And um, I, I'm comparing here the mass loss, which here I'm considering a proxy of, um, of CO2 and the new uh, binder. These are... Um, um, uh, experiments that I did during the pandemic in my uh, garage, I had to say, uh, and so I didn't have a, a spectrometer, but definitely the mass loss, it's uh, uh, very um, uh, low. So the new rock and the new rock blend actually allows a drastic reduction of CO2 um, emissions upon calcination. And the reason uh, why this rock is a volcanic rock, so nature has done the job for us, does not have any carbon uh, ion. Then we are using this um, alternative uh, material to grow fibers in the lab. These are the really the first fibers we grew in the lab for a completely different uh, application. Um, the, the, here you can see uh, more uh, SCM images of what we are doing in, uh, in my lab. And actually, I was very excited when I saw uh, this uh, picture because um, you can see fibers literally sprouting from uh, the binder, from the cementitious uh, materials, as it were a living uh, creature. Uh, clearly, we are also looking at how to increase the number of fibers. This tube SCM here, the scale is exactly the same, but um, we are uh, exploring uh, ways of uh, increasing the amount of uh, uh, fibers in a short period of time. And clearly, we're also looking at the entanglement, how to make fibers long enough so that they re resemble more and more as polymers uh, or geopolymers. Uh, but then how to make them uh, entangled. So in conclusion, um, uh, the, I hope uh, that I convince you that the cement decarbonation uh, is as much an engineering as a geoscience uh, challenging. And so this, in my opinion, this partnership is very uh, crucial to start cross-pollinating and also leveraging knowledge across 
the engineering and also um, the, the geoscience community. I like to um, uh, here uh, acknowledge uh, my cool uh, copy eyes, Alberto Saleo, who is the um, the chair of material science, and also Matteo Cagnello, who is an assistant professor in chemical engineering. Uh, so again, um, and, and clearly the students who are working uh, on that, that comes from two different uh, disciplines. Here, uh, the main take home uh, messages. Um, in my opinion, uh, to um, abate the, two, the CO2 emissions is very um, is cr crucial. We need to rely on a different uh, rocks and a rock blend. Um, because of this partnership, uh, we are used to say it takes two to tango, but it's actually, in this case, it ta takes two to tango. Um, the, the, so, as I mentioned, we are uh, relying on a natural rock uh, blend that provides a sustainable uh, binder precursor. Uh, we uh, have shown that the CO2 emissions, uh, there is a drastic re uh, reduction in CO2 emission. Uh, we are using um, a, a, a geomimetic approach that literally draw inspiration from the way Earth makes uh, chemistry and how this chemistry contributes to the mechanics of the cementation, the cementation of rocks and then hopefully of uh, concrete. In my opinion, there is a lot to consolidate and uh, cross-pollinate between the knowledge of nanominerals and nanotechnology to really understand how to control the growth and also the orientation of mineral fibers to enhance reinforcement at the nanoscale. And with that, uh, I leave you with this quote from Pliny that I was always uh, inspired. Um, nature, we need to look at nature, uh, but we also need to look at very small uh, designs. We are, have now the, te the technology uh, and uh, uh, we can learn and we can look uh, how uh, really Earth uh, makes uh, its chemistry. And with that, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you, you may have. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks, Tiziana. Um, so this volcanic rock, you didn't tell us what it was. Is it a, is it a magnesium silicate? I mean, is it aluminum silicate, or is it more the magnesium iron version? No, absolutely. So this is a rock that is called a calcalkaline rock. So it contains naturally both the calcium component and the alkaline component. And it's a rock that um, crops and forms in many places of the world. And, uh, um, actually are the place where we have subduction zones. So it's uh, clearly I started from Italy uh, where Roman concrete and I'm Italian originally. But actually this rock outcrops in any region of the Ring of Fire, so Japan, the Olysian, and also uh, clear here in the United States, uh, and also the Andes, for yeah, example. No, no, so I'm, but I'm interested in the chemical composition. So the Is chemical it? composition, uh, it's really a long uh, formula, but I can tell it's called calcalkaline uh, okay. rocks because it has the two components. So it has uh, magnesium oxide, magnesium calcium oxide, yeah. oxide um, uh, sodium um, um, uh, silicates yep. uh, and, uh, and potassium silicates. In fact, normally the type of volcanism where this rocks is uh, um, uh, created uh, is referred uh, in our uh, community as ultrapotastic volcanism, okay. which is typical of the subduction zones. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas Matsakos from Shell. Uh, is the, this presentation indicating that therefore we could reduce the amount of limestone being used as a raw material and then replace it with other aluminum silicates already found in nature in abundant quantity and therefore they will not re require high CO2 chemical emissions and fuel emissions? Yes. Uh, that's, that's yes, a game and I have to say, um, if you look at Roman concrete, and so really was when, actually I started from a rock uh, that um, I was interested for completely different uh, reason. It's a rock in a volcanic region uh, in Italy. It's the same region where Roman concrete was uh, engineered. And the rock exhibits 
high strength, but also uh, is able to um, withstand high strain. And then from there, I start looking at Roman concrete. If you look at Roman concrete, normally the recipe, at least the one that's been passed on uh, to us, the recipe says mix volcanic ash with a binder, and I will go back to the binder and some rubbles. Then if you look at the binder, Today, people believe it's limestone because that's what, you know, it's the recipe that has been passed on to us. But if you go back to the ancient um, texts, actually the Romans, or Vitruvius, the engineer, was simply say, we use white rocks. They didn't say, that, which then definitely over time has been translated as limestone, because limestone is white, but there are many other rocks that are white. Um, so this, I, I truly believe, uh, and so if you look at Roman concrete and the, the lime uh, relics that still are uh, there, there is a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, if you look at Roman concrete, for example, in the Israel uh, region, uh, Caesarea, uh, definitely the, the lime comes from um, uh, limestone. You see fossils inside, so it could be just uh, limestone. Besides, the composition is pure calcium oxide. But if you see, if you look at Roman concrete from the uh, Italian region, or also uh, the, the France uh, uh, region, basically you have a, a lime that actually could have come from a volcanic rocks. You see minerals that belong to a volcanic rocks. You don't see minerals that. So to answer your question, yes, uh, that rock can serve as binder, and it's possibly possible that even the ancient use it. Thank you. And now, actually, one thing I will echo from your state, your presentation is that Romans built and Greeks and whoever built those buildings to last for millennia. With the current way of concrete. Every 80 years, we have to replace it. Yeah. And can you imagine the cumulative CO2 emissions from that? Yeah. And this is why I mentioned Roman concrete did not use any uh, reinforcement, at least at a large scale. What you are seeing here, it's really Roman concrete before and after stressing uh, the concrete. So you see there are no fractures uh, going on, at least at this um, uh, scale. But then it was really when we look at the micro and nano scale that you see a lot of fibers, much more. And those are fibers that are really embedded in the matrix, so that clearly they were now added. Um, and, uh, and they are very intertwined. So somehow there is a technology out there uh, that somehow we lost. And so I'm glad today to work with uh, chemical engineers and uh, material scientists to see how can we, uh, to, to, to actually to build upon uh, a, a technology uh, like that with the tools that we have today. Wonderful, thank you. It looks a little like a plant cell wall, you know, the ultrastructure of a plant cell wall with all the cellulose or a cloth. You know, yeah, a yeah. cloth is yeah. a very, um, um, as the property that does, because all the, the threads are very well intertwined. Yeah, that's great, wonderful. Thanks, Tiziana, that's great.